Good afternoon and thank you for coming to the eighth seminar series in the Advanced Transportation Technology Seminar Series sponsored by the Roadway Safety Institute. Uh, again, this seminar is both um, broadcast to live audience as well as a remote audience. So please save all of your questions for the end. Um, and a schedule for the seminars, uh, future seminars, is on the table over here and also available on the Roadway Safety Institute website. Um, and for our online viewers, please be sure to go to the chat box to put your name, organization, and number of viewers so we can report it to the USDOT. Um, and that is also where you will put in your questions that we will get to at the end of the seminar. I am now going to turn the mic over to John Hordos, who will introduce our speaker. Hello, everybody. It is my great pleasure to present our uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Imram Hai. Uh, he's a professor at the uh, Electrical Engineering Department at the University of Minnesota, Duluth. And uh, he has uh, taken his degree in electrical engineering from the Southern uh, California University in, in Los Angeles in 1998. And after a short, uh, well, short six years, more or less yeah. uh, uh, stint in the industry. He decided to grace us with his presence in academia, and he became professor at the uh, University of Minnesota in Duluth in 2004. Uh, he holds 15 patents uh, in communication uh, systems, and uh, it is the go-to person for anybody in this state, at least, uh, in all terms uh, of connected vehicle communication systems, uh, direct short range communication, and the technical aspects of uh, talking vehicles. So it is my, it's also, he's also, and I should uh, point that out, he's also the director of the Connected Vehicles Research Laboratory at UMD, uh, who is a, a laboratory in electrical engineering that is devoted two advancements and projects in uh, connected vehicle the transportation technologies. Thank you very Dr. much, Hai. John, for the kind introduction. And uh, as you all know, the presentation today is all about uh, dedicated short-range communication. You know, the other common word is connected vehicle technology. So what, why, and how? That's what this is all about. Um, before that, let me show you some of my students. You know, uh, I will not have opportunity to talk about specific work which they have been doing, but uh, just wanted to show you that you know this lab which we talk about CVRL. This is enabled by these students. This is the lab, Connected Vehicles Research Lab, which we have at UMD. Uh, and if you are interested, you can certainly go to the website and see various projects which we have been involved in. So today's story is going to be this. This is the outline of the story. First, I'll describe the background. Then what is DSRC? Then why DSRC uh, is the better choice uh, as compared to other competitors? And then some of the applications we'll talk about uh, and the range of applications. Um, then widespread deployment hurdles. You know, there are some hurdles which we'll, we'll discuss. And then I'll summarize. So that is the story outline of my talk today. Um, so the background goes like, I think really it's a problem. Everybody had this problem uh, to solve. And this is a commonly known problem. 5 million crashes per year on average, 2 million injuries, uh, 30,000 deaths um, per year, similar amount of deaths as you have with the guns. Um, leading cause of death in ages 4 to 34. Similarly, mobility is another issue, uh, 5 billion hours of travel delay and 100 billion cost of urban congestion. You know, the economic analysis which has been done, the lo hours lost, they contribute to this much amount in economy. So, and also mobility causes some environmental loss also, 3 billion gallons of wasted fuel and each gallon of wasted fuel basically adds to the carbon footprint, you know, climate effect. So all these, these things are real problems, and everybody is trying to solve you know, one way or the other, either partially or fully, these problems. Uh, and, and 
of course, the people in technology field and engineering field, they are thinking whether we can solve some of these problems using technology. Can technology help? And being electrical engineer, you know, those engineers who know this kind of communication technology, of course, you can see the DSRC is one option. There, is a, there are other options, cellular, internet, WiMAX, Wi-Fi. All these technologies are out there, whether they can actually help mitigate some of these problems. So dedicated short range communication um, was kind of initiated in 1999. And since then, there is sometimes they have been expedited research, sometimes slowed down. In the beginning, especially, it was slowed down. But later on, there was an expedited research. And, and according to US DOT, looks like that 80% of the crashes by unimpaired drivers can be reduced, mitigated, or prevented using DSRC. So this is a huge motivation. Of course, this yet has to be tested because it has not been widely uh, or, or deployed yet. But ultimately, ultimately, you know, if when it is deployed, this will be tested. But for now, many researches indicate in many safety pilot programs also, uh, experiments, research, they indicate that this is possible. And of course, DSRC can also help mobility and environment. You know, some, as we, we will see, some of the applications will hint towards that, that it can also mitigate not only safety-oriented, uh, you know, uh, it cannot only prevent lives by having safety-oriented applications, but also mobility applications, where you can, you know, uh, make the travel, uh, travel time more efficient or, or reduce the travel times by informing in advance to the drivers. So what is DSRC? FCC, Federal Communication Commission, has authorized 75 megahertz of spectrum, 5.850 to 5.925 gigahertz for DSRC, about 75 megahertz. This was, this was done in 1999. And since then, you know, the idea initially was that there will be many roadside equipment, uh, roadside DSRC units. So it was more focused towards V to I part, or I to V. Uh, but later on, they realized that to covering all the roads with so many, so many uh, uh, DSRC units will be, you know, cost prohibitive. Too much capital cost is needed. So it was kind of a slowdown. The idea was slow down, and and suddenly, then maybe a few years later, I think it was about a few years later, then V to V part was emphasized. You know, what we can do with the V to V part, and then it it geared up again. And ultimately, I think ultimately there has to be a combination of V2I and V2V. Many applications will be around V2V, but V2I will be needed for some important applications, especially to provide security uh, for all this communication. And, and we will talk about that as well. So this is really a short to medium range communication aimed as a replacement to the 802.11 wireless standards, which is common Wi-Fi standard. So it's, it's not a totally new standard definition that, you know, you can't really, you know, build uh, new communication or new software and hardware infrastructure, although new hardware and software infrastructure will be needed, but it would be very similar to the Wi-Fi. There will be some extra things which Wi-Fi lacks, this will have, and we'll talk about those uh, as well. So it supports both uh, both public safety and private operations. We'll talk about those. And operates in V2V environment and V2I environment. What, what these are really. Let's try to look at it uh, for a moment. But before that, let me uh, share with you the overall DSRC infrastructure. What, what it is intended to be is that there is going to be a DSRC radio, the wireless communication device. And it will be connected, of course, with some kind of a computer interface. And, and then it will be also connected to a driver interface, how the driver will communicate, whether it will be audio, visual, or something else, without disturbing or distracting the driver. Uh, similarly, there will be a GPS is essential part of this, you know, an important, important sensor which will provide the position to the DSRC radio as well as to the computer. So internal sensors will be present too. Some other internal sensors to get uh, other indicators about, about the vehicle. Um, but position is, is the extremely important indicator uh, which DSRC radio will be needed, and, and we will notice it a uh, little bit later in the talk. So the V2V environment is that 
vehicles are all connected with each other. Once all vehicle are, vehicles are equipped with DSRC devices, they will be able to communicate with each other. And they will be transmitting, communicating through these BSMs, basic safety messages. These are standardized messages, and I'll show you the structure of those messages too. And the frequency is, uh, right now is anticipated to be 10 hertz, 10 times a second. Um, and of course, the, the ideal antenna pattern is supposed to be omnidirectional, you know, 360 degrees, because you don't know where the vehicle is going to be. So you do, don't want to maximize it just in the front direction. So this is, this is why the range is compromised a little bit. If you kind of have it more directional, you can have a little bit better range. But you know, because of the orientation of, you know, especially when the, uh, the, the roads are looping around, this is better to have it omnidirectional. So usually when a vehicle receives BSM, which will contain, of course, the coordinates of position coordinates of the other vehicle too. So it will try to understand, the vehicle the computer will try to understand what, what kind of threat level is there, whether vehicle is approaching too much to me or I am, you know, my, you know, this vehicle is approaching too much to another vehicle. So these kind of things are, are estimated, analyzed, and, and processed, then something is, is communicated to driver ultimately, you know, whether some decision making is needed or some other control needs to be act actuated uh, so that things can be taken into account. So this is the idea behind V2V environment. So the basic safety message is the key to that. Now what is V2I? There are some other standardized messages in, on, one is called TIM, Traveler Information Message, and the other two are SPAT and MAP, signal phase and timing and, and, and MAP. These are especially useful for, for the signals or intersection areas. And TIM is more like on a freeway, you know, when vehicles are coming, uh, coming and they can be informed whether there's a work zone ahead or not. So these are messages which come from the infrastructure, roadside units, which have DSRC capability. So they will be issuing these and, and they, of course, roadside units can also be interfaced with the IP or through the internet or using LTE or cellular or whatever or Wi-Fi so that they can also receive messages or instructions from the central um, processing stations to communicate to the driver. So this is the idea behind that. RSCs will have an important uh, functionality to provide security or, or to issue certificates for the authenticity of the messages which vehicles will exchange with each other. And we'll talk briefly about that as well because I'll try to cover almost as many aspects of, of DSRC as there are, but of course not in depth. Uh, we will talk about, you know, almost in a broad way. So these are some of the DSRC standards. If you're familiar with the, you know, some communication wireless standards, this is a typical uh, physical layer and MAC layer, and then some of the non-safety application, the Wi-Fi, TCP, UDP kind of thing. And then these are more specific, you know, uh, there is a specific message dictionary by SAE, J2735. These are the special message, BSM, TIM, SPAT, MAP, all these messages are part of, there are about 16 or so part of this dictionary, and each message supposed to have the, the proper content, so they are spelled out in that, those standards. And similarly, J2945, these are kind of a minimum preference requirements on board, you know, in terms of the coordinates and, you know, uh, the transmission and speed, what are the appropriate speeds or distance from the other vehicle? So I think this, they cover those kind of aspects. J2735, they cover the communication aspects, what will be exchanged. They cover what is needed on vehicle. So these are the things which they work uh, hand in hand. Some of these things require, I mean, determine what contents go inside those messages. Um, and of course, some of the service advertisement for commercial also that what other services can be provided. Uh, so these things, you know, those standards cover that. And then there's, of course, 1609.2, IEEE 1609.2 is, is security related. We're going, to talk, we're going to talk briefly about that, how this can be made all secure. And of course, some of the privacy issues are involved in that as well. This is a typical approach, uh, you know, seven layer, physical, data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application layer. Application is more like, you know, user friendly thing, what user is really concerned about. And this is all about, um, you know, 
how to enable that ultimately to reach that level. Physical layer is what is 802.11p instead of A. A is for Wi-Fi, P will make it for DSRC. So a slight change in standards. So this is again IEEE uh, P1609. They, all, they basically dictate how these layers will be implemented. Uh, so just wanted to give you a flavor of this, the, the DSRC protocol stack. This is more important. I want to discuss a little bit more uh, DSRC spectrum. As you know, this is about 75 megahertz, and there are five gigahertz. Uh, five megahertz is about is guard band, and there are seven. Uh, there will be seven channels, uh, which are 10 megahertz each. This is the channel 172, which will be reserved for basic safety message exchanges. So, and, and, and you can see that the max power is about 20 dBm because this is supposed to be for the vehicle to vehicle. This is reserved for critical safety of life and, you know, and, and property. This is reserved for that. Similarly, 184 channel, this is also reserved for high power public safety. It's more like RSCs. RSCs use that channel. They will have more power. They will be able to communicate for longer, you know, uh, to cover more vehicles. So they are also safety-oriented applications, but RSC-oriented. On the other hand, these channels, uh, these two can be combined either uh, as a 120 megahertz channel or two 10 megahertz channels, and similarly these two as well. They are more service channels. Uh, you can have more applications. For example, private applications where, you know, for example, advanced traveler information applications, those kind of things, or parking management, those kind of things. And uh, how to let people know or drivers know about these channels? This is the control channel, which is more like, you know, service advertisement and broadcast. You know, let people know that these are the other applications available. However, this basic safety machine, this and this, they kind of override. You know, they are more, they are high priority. So when something like that is, you know, overtakes, you know, everything basically is less priority. So this is the kind of structure which is there, and you can see slightly different spectrum in Europe, but technically same. Uh, Japan is, I think, is slightly different, but technically the spectrum can be shifted here and there a little bit, wherever the space is available, but basic structure of these channels and safety channels as well as control channels that remains same. Now, by the way, I also want to mention the power difference is 40 dBm versus 20 dBm is 10,000, 100 times more power as compared to this for RSE. Although this is 20 dBm, but I think now people have even in vehicle about up to 28 dBm, a little bit higher power to get more range. Uh, message types, DSRC message types, which I earlier talked about. Uh, there are about 16 or so, but I'm only uh, listing here five of them, basic safety message and probe vehicle data message. These are supposed to be uh, issued by the vehicle. BSM is continuously, continuously uh, exchanged by vehicles at, at the uh, rate of 10 hertz. Probe vehicle data, it depends upon whether there is a need of that or not, but usually the probe vehicle data messages are supposed to be exchange with RSC so that RSC can upload, you know, can take some data from import path history and these kind of things from the vehicle to estimate, you know, uh, to do some kind of a management, traffic management scenarios. Similarly, travel information message, map, and signal phase and timing message, they are supposed to be issued by the infrastructure, especially map and uh, SPAT messages, the in in intersection signals, they issue those. SPAT will contain all those timing diagrams, you know, uh, all those timings and phases of uh, signals, whether it's green or red, so that vehicle can understand whether the signal is green or red. Map will be the, of course, the having the coordinates of, of, of uh, roads, especially cross-section, intersection, these kind of things, so that the vehicle can know where it is. and, and some of those, those, some of that data can also contain the GPS correction data. You know, sometimes GPS may have some error, so it may have some correction data, so you can also locate your position more accurately. And travel information is more uh, dedicated towards advanced traveler information message that, you know, there's a travel time ahead, there's an accident ahead, and, and, and the queue ahead is, is say, 
uh, 15 minutes long, these kind of things, so that you can change your route. These kind of things are covered in TIM message. General structure, sorry, general structure of the, 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 the messages is really straightforward. There's some kind of a header information and then payload, and, and the number of bytes is really fixed. Here I'm using the octet. Octet is same as byte, and I'm going to show you this a uh, little bit more spelled out for BSM. You can see that uh, average message size is about 320 bytes, and, and physical MAC and uh, uh, WSMP layer is about 80 bytes. Security, including certificates, 160. So identified is about 80 bytes. Security is this much. And payload is about 80 bytes. Uh, the transmission rate is 10 hertz. And you can see this, these are some of the essential parts in part one of so the 80, 80 bytes would cover this. Uh, it will have a temporary ID, time, position, motion control, vehicle size, and some of the other things, event flags, you know, whether the wipers are on or not, something like that, uh, path history, path prediction, those kind of things are in the part two. And I also wanted to show you part, part one and part two in a little bit more detail. You can see the part one, which is essential. Longitude, lat latitude, and elevation. These are the position, uh, and also some kind of accuracy. You know how much is positional accuracy is there, and then speed, transmission. You know all those things are here, uh, and then some of these things, ABS. You know hazard lights and all those things, which are not really as mandatory, but these are optional depending upon what kind of application you come up with. It's more like, more like iPhone. You know when iPhone came, there were not many applications. Uh, you know, but there was a basic you know, infrastructure ready. Similarly, there is a basic infrastructure, what people are talking about. There are many applications they have thought about, but many applications have not surfaced yet. So this is the idea behind that. So these are some of, some of these are really placeholders which can be used to enable those future anticipated applications. Uh, I also want to show you again the, the infrastructure of the TIM message. The same thing, basically, you know, but you can see that work zone, uh, you know, especially work zone um, uh, content means where is the work zone, how far it is, and the coordinates, how long it is, these kind of things. And exit service uh, content, speed limit, you know, of a particular road, these kind of things can be issued, which driver can take advantage of uh, are in this TIM message. Now, why DSRC, right? You know, we know that there are other competitors, Wi-Fi, cellular. Uh, why DSRC? Let's look at it. Uh, of course, this is the dedicated nature of DSRC, which will make it more promising. You don't rely upon third-party infrastructure, like Wi-Fi or cellular. Something can go wrong. For safety-critical applications especially, if you have something dedicated that is excellent. If you rely on third party, for example, if you want to communicate to the next car that through a cellular tower that, okay, you know, I'm approaching near you, so you should slow down or, you know, I should slow down if you have to communicate through that, you're depending upon third party infrastructure. That can delay as well as uh, reliability issue, right? So these are the issues. This is why dedicated part is really important. Some of the other key benefits the standards are really similar to Wi-Fi, so not really totally new standards, which is helpful in implementation. Low latency, you know, less than 50 millisecond, and I'll, I'll show you a chart comparing latency of other technologies, and you will realize that, you know, this latency is really what is needed for specially safety critical applications. Uh, high data rate transfer. This doesn't look like high data rate, but you will see from the application's point of view, this is good enough data rate. Line of sight and range, you know, it's 100 meter, uh, uh, th sorry, 1,000 meter, 1 kilometer, and 360 degrees. Uh, and I'll also show you uh, uh, the range comparison of different technology, and you'll be able to understand why, why DSRC is more important. And then, of course, low power message reception. You know, the vehicle can receive at very low power, although you transmit at high, but it means that the range can be extended. This is the first comparison chart which I wanted to share with you. You can see this is DSRC, also called WAVE. You know, um, uh, Wi-Fi is the other technology which is used at your home. Cellular is what is used, LTI, 3G, all those are cellular technologies. And then mobile, WiMAX. Wi-Fi is actually not intended for 
for vehicle environment outside, but WiMAX is. WiMAX is enables cities. You know, it, if you want to have provide, provide Wi-Fi in a city environment, then you do WiMAX. Basically, it's the same concept, but you know, things change. Even, even here, for example, in, 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 in uh, UFM campus, it will be more like a WiMAX because there are multiple routers, right? You are not connected to a dedicated router at one point. You know, you will keep on changing the routers as you go building to building or from, you know, one place to another place. So you can see that uh, data rate is okay, comparable probably to all. Silver is probably a little smaller, although with LTI it can be, it can be bumped up. Uh, mobility is important. Vehicles are traveling at very fast speed, so mobility is important. Uh, but WiMAX can handle mobility too. Wi-Fi cannot. Uh, nominal bandwidth, one channel is 10 megahertz, so it's again comparable. Cellular is a little less. Again, LTI can bump it up. Uh, band, you know, of course, these the bands are different. It doesn't really matter, matter what band, but this band is really dedicated, right? So only vehicles can use it. Now, this is the range, and you can get an idea. Here, what I have is radar vision, regular vision, LIDAR, which is supposed to be better, um, and uh, V2X. You know, this is DSRC. You can see this is the best in terms of range up to now, and also omnidirectional. So this is ultimately, because the last application which I'll talk about is the automated vehicle technology. You know, how autonomous vehicles will be enabled by connecting vehicle technology. And this is really an important uh, reason behind that. Uh, latency, you can see that, uh, first, this is the chart which so shows that active safety latency requirements. So traffic signal violation, you need about 0.1 second. Curve speed warning, one second. Emergency electronic braid, 0.1 second. Pre-crash sensing, of course, you know, forward collision warning kind of thing. It's, it's uh, 0.02 seconds. So you can see that this is the requirement. Uh, its max is about 0.1 second if you take the curve speed warning out. Uh, otherwise, uh, and you can see this is the latency of these existing technologies. Cellular is here, you know, in seconds. Wi-Fi, uh, two-way satellite, Bluetooth, WiMAX, all these are really in seconds. And uh, this is the the you know, the one second limit, but most of them are about 0.02 seconds. So DSRC can provide you a latency of 50 milliseconds. So that is really the best for safety oriented application. So this is a single most keys. This along with the range are really important factors which contribute towards, you know, significance why DSRC for these applications. This is a general envelope I'm showing you. Um, Usually, the DSRC data rate versus range, this is a typical graph of as range increases, data rate goes down. And this is the kind of working envelope that this is the boundary of DSRC performance. You can see uh, the data transfer um, applications can work on this. You know, at very low range means you're very close to RSC and you're trying to upload or download some of the data. Um, they, they can work here uh, at high data rates. Uh, similarly, the safety applications, when, you know, in this range and reasonable amount of data, you, data rate you need, and this is emergency vehicle services, right, uh, where range is important, uh, preempt, signal preemption kind of those services. Uh, the data rate is not as important here. So, and then the data rate is low and, and range is low for the toll and, and payment services, those kind of services. So the various, you know, depending upon what application, you know, you can determine what, what area of this envelope you have to work and you can you know design your application accordingly now some of the applications let me talk about um, there are of course various kinds of applications so what i will do is i've split it into v2v safety applications then v2i safety application and some of the commercial vehicle operations application and private. Most of these applications are, are mobility and environment applications. But, but V2I and v, uh, V2V applications are safety oriented and, and because BSM is, will be mandatory, once the vehicle will have DSRC equipment, the BSM will be mandatory. Similarly, you know, PVD, the probe vehicle data, may be mandatory for some commercial, you know, some 
uh, you know, vehicles from, say, Minnesota Department of Transportation or U.S. Department of Transportation of those authorities. But BSM will be the only message which will be mandatory. Other messages, TIM, SPAT, etc., they will be optional. So V2V safety application um, enabled by BSM. Forward collision avoidance, emergency electronic brake lights, blind spot warning, lane change assist, do not pass warning, intersection collision warning, wrong way driver warning, cooperative adaptive cruise control warning. Uh, and not really warning, but cruise control. You know, right now, of course, you have a cruise control and you can set it and you don't have to accelerate or brake. But cooperative adaptive cruise control means that you have platoon of vehicles. They are going on same speed. They can communicate with each other. If one slow down, the other slow down as well. So that is what will be enabled by those BSMs, because they will be able to exchange information with each other. Some of the applications, I, I can tell you, this is very straightforward. Forward collision warning, that if the vehicle is stopped or slowed, uh, driving at very slow speed, and then you're, you're approaching that with the DSRC communication, you can find out that you know how close you are and the, even the brakes can take over. If there's a, a fully automated, you know, even brakes can be taken over. But at least you driver can be indicated uh, that you know, it needs to be stopped. Similarly, this, uh, if there's a back of the queue you know, uh, and there's no visibility or even at a distance, you can, be, you, know, you can be informed that there's a queue ahead and be prepared to slow down. These are the kind of things uh, which can be enabled by that. And similarly, V2 eye safety applications. Uh, as far as safety applications concerned, when it will be fully deployed, even SPAD and MAP will become kind of mandatory. The, those signals will be equipped with our, uh, DSRC devices. They will be communicating those or transmitting those messages. Vehicles will be receiving those, and the signal red and light, uh, green light, will become obsolete. That, I'm not saying that that's going to happen. Uh, uh, in near future, but ultimately far future, that is the vision that could happen. But some of the applications will be red light running, left turn assist, right turn assist, pedestrian signal assist, emergency vehicle preempt. Basically, you know, the signal preemption uh, that the vehicle is going and all signals become red instead of you honing and, you know, sounding your horn and, and everybody pulls over. So the things can be taken care of automatically and driver can receive a message on, on his uh, dashboard that, oh, there's an emergency vehicle, so slow down or, or pull, uh, pull up. Uh, similarly, this, you know, there are some other rail crossing, and I have um, uh, some of the messages, uh, some of the applications listed here, which will be enabled by MAP and SPAT. Uh, you know, especially around intersection, many things can be done, you know, left turn assist, right turn assist, and pedestrian crossing. Ultimately, pedestrians will be equipped with DSRC too when, you know, whole thing happens, you know. Everything is supposed to be connected in a future world. You know, even there will be some fictional stories or movies you can see that this is going to happen, but there has to be a, a, a slow path towards that. So this is just the rail crossing. If a rail is coming, you know, then if this conventional Conventional uh, grid crossing is equipped with the SRC it, and train is also equipped. It can receive the signal and it can operate the grid. Uh, you know, this is the kind of application where not all vehicles need to be equipped with V2V. Only commercial vehicle and you know, these infrastructure need to be equipped so that these can be uh, made worked out. And ultimately, if this vehicle is equipped, this will not be needed as well. So you will have on your dashboard that you know, the vehicle can how much is the safe time, for example, it is 10 seconds away or 20 seconds away, these kind of things can be uh, indicated to the driver. And then work zone warning systems. Uh, these are some of, you know, uh, especially in our lab, we are working on some of the projects which are related to work zone warning. And you can see if there is a uh, work zone and a DSRC can be placed there, it can communicate the message to the vehicle that this is, you know, this is the work zone ahead. But if you can see directly uh, DSRC to, to vehicle, the range is not as much, probably just one kilometer. The practical lengths of the work zones could be much longer. So that is why it is important to engage V2V communication as well, so that this can 
this the, the TIM, the travel information message can be communicated to the vehicles which are much behind and which uh, who yet have to approach the, the work zone. And now some of the CVO application, commercial vehicle operation applications, um, both V2I and V2V based, you know, border crossing, control loss warning, driver log, fleet management, freight inventory, all these things, you know, wireless inspection, vehicle diagnosis, way in motion, specific to the, you know, commercial trucks. So many application people are already thinking about, uh, I don't have time to go into detail of these, but there are also some private applications, you know, just the parking management or, you know, fueling uh, management, how to, how to do that. Um, uh, our access exit control, these kind of things, uh, and some of these are listed here, access control, probe data traffic information, fuel driver, uh, drive-through management, parking management, rental car transactions, service record, vehicle diagnostics, and advanced TIS, traveler information system. So all these applications are being, being thought through. The relevant industries, uh, industries are spending time in figuring out if DSRC becomes, you know, uh, are deployed widely. Are, it is, in a sense, it is mandated that all new vehicles will have the SRC devices from the next year, to, basically. But it may, I think, get delayed to another year or so because there is still some testing phase going on. But car manufacturers are on board with this. You know, they know with the US DOT that they know that this is going to be useful and ultimately the future because they have to have some way to communicate, you know, uh, from vehicle to vehicle. So and this is, looks like for now, this is the best way to do so without relying on a third party infrastructure. Now, this is the important application automated vehicles, which apparently right now is disconnected with the connected vehicle technology, with the SRC part. But uh, let me uh, talk about the connection later on. But how the autonomous vehicles work right now is, is basically it has all the sensors, right? Uh, it can detect you know, vehicles around it, pedestrians around it, and then it can maneuver, it can steer, it can brake. So that's how it, it is built right now. And that is what is Google's approach. But, but generally speaking, this is what uh, US DOT's um, requirements are. You know, our various levels are for autonomous vehicles. Level zero is really no autonomy. And no steering or braking control, you know, uh, um, basically just regular what we have right now, right? Uh, so level one is, you know, function-specific automation, braking, throttle, or steering control, but not in combination, for example, automatic braking systems, ABS. So this is also that this kind of a widespread, level zero and one. So level two, three, and four are really critical, which we are anticipating. And of course, Google has it, you know, Tesla has it, Uber has it, um, but these are various levels. So level two is, Integration of braking, throttle, and steering control, driver available at all times to take control in level two. Level three, integration of braking, throttle, and steering control, driver expected to, for occasional control, driver can cede full monitoring and control authority. But level four is what there is no re need for the driver. Driver not expected for control. No, everything is fully controlled. So it's basically brain of the driver, hands of the driver, and legs of the driver are in that vehicle, level four. And that is what Google has it. Tesla has it too. Uh, Google's approach is this. And you can see Google just announced, I think, last week uh, that they have completed two million miles, test miles, on their autonomous vehicles. And what, what they claim is that they have only mastered 90% of the scenarios, means that you know, more complicated scenarios than especially urban or suburban environment, you know, intersections here and there, roundabouts, they have not really mastered those yet. They yet have to, and, and, and they have claimed that those 10% are really the hardest ones. So that's the direction which Google is going. This is Google's approach. This should not be mixed with the connected vehicle technology. Right now, Google's approach has nothing to do with DSRC or connected vehicle technology. But connected vehicle technology will ultimately merge with this approach. And this is what the, uh, the vision is. This, this is the connected vehicle technology where vehicles can talk to each other. And you notice the range, LIDAR, which you know, is an important sensor on Google's uh, vehicles. You can see that that range is very limited. And especially if you are, suppose if you are entering from a ramp to a freeway, 
then you may not be able to see with LIDAR how far are the other vehicles. But with DSRC, you may be able to see those, right? So these are some of the things which, this is why ultimately this connected vehicle technology will merge with autonomous vehicle technology, uh, with the sensors, and they will merge together. Of course, this will continue to advance, this will continue to advance, and so the merge. Ultimately, this full autonomation will be enabled by the marriage of connected vehicle technology and autonomous vehicle technology, which exists as of now. So this is the vision, really, in future, uh, as far as I can understand. I want to issue in, in last few minutes some of the things, uh, some of the hurdles which are present in terms of widespread deployment. Um, and, and those are really privacy, security, positioning, and scalability. And I'm going to talk one by one about these. Um, but it's really, you know, kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, you process and then perception of people and then, you know, infrastructure and then process, you know, whether the infrastructure should be placed first and then people will be able to perceive or the vehicles will come later, you know, these kind of things. So this is more, there are many political issues, policy issues as well in this. Those are the hurdles which I will not talk about. You know, you can already know that even in, in autonomous cars, there, there's an important issue regarding insurance. You know, who would be responsible for an accident? Accident would still happen, you know, the cars will be damaged. So who would be responsible? Even if there is no uh, intentional uh, crash, there will be some, you know, storms and property damage, those, and who will be responsible? Those are the kind of issues uh, which I will not discuss, but I'll talk about privacy. It's important security and positioning and scalability. This is the chart which I want to show. I, I got it from Google Images. Um, interesting one, you can see that ultimately, you know, the, the vehicle V2V, V2, V2 uh, cyclist, I think, uh, then V2 pedestrians, V2 homes, V2 grid, and then V2 I. I, I this should not be that far though, but anyway, so you can see that, you know, ultimately the vision is that every, everything will be connected. So let's talk about privacy, security, positioning, and scalability now. Privacy. What is the real concern? Uh, information is abused, right? You can say that, you know, information is abused or we can be tracked. We can be sent home a ticket, for example. Or, you know, uh, we want to go somewhere, you know, and we don't want everybody to know that where we went. Genuine uh, concern. Authorities could track us, you know, a third party as well as authorities could track us, like they can send us a ticket. Um, so privacy is really the key element of this whole DSRC, the uh, uh, protocol. No data tracking or trajectory logging of an individual vehicle. As of now, BSM is supposed to be, you know, every 10 hertz only vehicles, you know, they exchange. Only the probe vehicle data that is supposed to be issued by only commercial vehicles or vehicles by, owned by authorities. Regular private vehicles are not supposed to log any data of any other vehicle, nor their data will be logged anywhere. So this is not how this is envisioned right now. As similarly, the identifiers, they are changed every few minutes. Right now, the, the protocol says about every five minutes. So there is no way you can be actually tracked. Even for some, say, uh, traffic management purposes, your data, for example, your path history can be stored somewhere in RSC or sent to the central station, but that will not track that what particular VIN number your vehicle had or driver information in it. It will have only the, the, temporary, priv uh, the temporary identifier of that message so that you can say this is the same vehicle. And sometimes it is difficult to even figure out this is the same vehicle because identifier keeps on changing every five minutes. So this is an important part of this protocol. 1609.2, which also deals with security, that's also, you know, uh, dictates that there has to be pseudonymous certificates. And we will talk about certificates a little bit later. So this is the privacy. So in my understanding, privacy is really not the concern anymore because, you know, although these concerns uh, are, are considering what is being done are not going to be uh, prove, you know, uh, to be true. However, you know, at the end of the day, when you gain some benefit, you give up some privacy. You know, right now, if you want to Google about somebody, you, 
you can find even his or her social security number. So you give up some privacy. You know, your financial institutions or third parties, they know about you, right? You rely upon them that there's, you know, no, uh, the, your privacy will be, will be respected, but, and they try to respect it, but there is hacking going on. So we hear now and then that, you know, Yahoo 500 million users were hacked. So the, the data is compromised one way or the other. So that is a security is more important issue, right? So security, what, for, what, what is done for security in DSRC? First, of course, what are the real concerns? Terrorists, right? Uh, threats are real concerns. Uh, there will be no control applications uh, on, on day one. For example, if this is widespread, just like, you know, Apple is, is very closed environment, right? The Apple has to sign those applications. So who will sign these applications? Not anybody will be able to have the application and throw to you and you will get so many spams or hoax messages. This is not what's going, what is supposed to be so, right? So this is a genuine concern. Um, so risk is really that when attacks happen, false alarms, annoyed users, users you know, turn off their systems and ultimately everything becomes useless. So you want to avoid that anyway. You want to make sure if you mandate something that is not too much, that is not a burden to the driver, but only provides some tangible benefits and in a secure way. So what is done regarding security is that 1609 security protocol defines secure message formats and processing circumstances for using secure messages, message exchanges. But how this is done, authentication means the certificate exchange, which I will show you in the next slide, encryption at each link level, data is encrypted. And the encryption keys are provided um, through certificates. You can see that, you know, this authority, central authority, which is technically U.S. government, U.S. DOT, they will provide certificates. And they will provide certificates to vehicles through some either DSRC, through roadside units, or cellular, or Wi-Fi. So this third-party infrastructure is necessary to provide security, or I can say infrastructure is necessary to provide security for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. So vehicle will be able to talk to each other. Even, you know, they can report misbehaved vehicles. If the vehicle, you know, certificate is old or something, you know, is fishy, malfunctioning, for example, a vehicle computer can go bad, these kind of things. They can be reported back and they can revoke some of those certificates. So this is how the basic certification, you know, uh, and security certification is, is uh, enabled in DSRC. So the infrastructure is necessary, and there could be some regional authorities, by the way, not only central authority, because that is only one. There could be regional authorities, like MinDOT could become a regional authority of US DOT. So they will be issuing those, those certificates for security. Now, positioning is another issue, especially in the automated vehicles, you know, environment. For example, you have to see you know, which roads you are on, right? So that is a bigger circle, which is easy to do. Right now, GPS can tell you which road you are on. All navigation devices do. But then if you figure out what road, you have to know what, which lane. That is difficult. Even today, regular GPS cannot do that. Advanced GPS, differential GPS, RTK, those, those they can do it, but you can't. And then if you know that, then you have to really know, you know, what is, the, what is the relevant distance between them, right? So these are the kind of issues, you know, uh, by the way, the, I uh, skip one, we're in lane, sorry, we're in lane, you know, whether you're right side of the lane, left side of the lane, that is even difficult to do. So sometimes that may be necessary, especially the safety oriented, critical safety oriented applications. So those are the issues which yet have to be resolved uh, at a reasonable cost. At, if the cost is unlimited, technology exists today. You can actually predict even one millimeter, except for those environments where, you know, downtown environment, where a lot of multipath interferences, most of the other places you can actually do it. Uh, but it also depends upon the cost, how it can be done at, at a cost effective way. That is the issue. Scalability. You know, 80% of the crashes can be prevented by unimpaired drivers, but will that all work really in this kind of environment where, you know, too much congestion, too many cars all around, right? So scalability is the issue. Um, right now, people are 
thinking about it, whether there would be a bandwidth uh, kind of a you know, broadcast storm. You know, vehicle, all vehicles will be issuing, all vehicles will be issuing BSM. There will be so many BSMs, you know, it would be a kind of a bandwidth congestion as well. So how things will work out in that kind of environment? It has not been tested yet. There, there are many theoretical or simulations which have been done, but will this all really work? and be beneficial. So this is, these are some of the issues which people are doing research on. So let me just summarize now. I think we are just about, about in time. Technology can help in future generation transportation systems, no doubt. DSRC has unique characteristics to enable future generation intelligent transportation systems for very specific reasons, especially latency and range. Uh, DSRC works both in V2I and V2V environments providing many safety and mobility applications. DSRC will facilitate ultimately connected vehicle technology. This is, again, not only my opinion, but many people are thinking that way, that ultimately this is really connected vehicle technology which will enable fully you know, autonomous vehicles. Um, and, and, you know, not only, you know, cars which will be expensive, but also it will reduce the cost as well because Vehicles will be able to exchange coordinates with each other instead of having those, you know, expensive sensors on them. Uh, then there are some concerns, of course, you know, but I think the technology prog is progressing as well as there are many anticipated benefits, so these concerns will go away and ultimately this will be deployed. Again, this is my opinion. Some people have opinion of, of this kind, but many others don't think that way. There are there are some skepticals still. Uh, so we don't know what, what direction future will take, but I think there has to be, it, you know, ultimately the, the future is of technology and looks like DSRC is very promising technology for future. And with that, I'll uh, finish and open to any questions. Yes, please. So we are waiting for a question. Uh, uh, yes, how much will it cost to retrofit um, a single intersection or a vehicle with the uh, DSRC? It's a good question because ultimately if all new vehicles have this as a standardized equipment, of course the older vehicle, you know, will like to retrofit it or maybe buy a box, just like navigation devices, right? Some vehicles come with navigation devices built in and some you buy it and right now that costs probably $100 or so, sometimes even cheaper. Right now, for example, those DSRC boxes, which, you know, universities are getting for research and other organizations getting, they cost about a few thousand dollars. But the, the reason is that, you know, because it is, uh, the market is not as, as big. When there will be too many people requiring this, the cost will come down, and I don't really think it should cost more than $100 ultimately to retrofit it, especially when, you know, many vehicles will have it. So this is the cost. Right now it's probably 1000 to retrofit it, uh, but ultimately it will come in just a couple of hundreds. We have a question from online. Yes. Um, you said the signal controller will be DSRC equipped in the future. Are the existing signal controllers capable of being equipped with DSRC? Yeah, I mean, uh, they can be made equipped. They have power, that's all what is needed. So I think what will happen is that the DSRC message, which is SPAT, that will adapt to that controller standards. And, you know, that's how it will work. So they are not really, you know, they cannot be equipped. We, nobody is expecting that the controller will change because for, for the time being, for quite a bit, quite a bit of time, the signals will keep operating as well as those, you know, DSRC SPAT message will go to the vehicles. So both will work together. Ultimately, you know, ultimately signals will be totally become obsolete. But during that time, the DSRC message format has to adapt that format. So that is how it will be made to, you know, work with that. One There's more question from online. Um, what are the bandwidth limitations with DSRC? Can radar images forecast this, these things? Et can radar images? Sorry, what is the question? Can radar uh, images? What, what are the bandwidth limitations with DSRC? Can radar images um, forecast, 
et cetera. All right. I, I think the bandwidth is about 10 megahertz for one channel, the critical channel. So the data rate is not really as high. Uh, radar, I'm not really sure what does that mean by radar images. Um, I don't really know what is the co connection. But, but of course, you know, depending upon what application, you may not need very high data rate. You know, you don't need data in 100 megabit per second range. You need probably, you know, uh, in single digital to maybe 10 or 20 megabit per second, and that is that is what is bandwidth limitation is of the SRC. Um, how come Google chose to go with LiDAR as opposed to DSRC in the first place? Uh, the, I think this is again a chicken and egg kind of thing. Google's Google had to go to LiDAR approach because for DSRC, other vehicles have to be connected as well. So Google did not want to depend upon other vehicles. So you had to, he, he had to go, you know, you, Google had to adopt this approach. So you can build everything. If you put money and technology in one car, you can simulate a driver's brain and hands and legs, and you can do things, right? But, but ultimately, if you want to enable it, you know, or, or have it in a kind of a mass autonomous vehicle environment, you have to do this connected vehicle technology. So Google did not have any other option at that time. This option can be only adopted by U.S. DOT or car manufacturers. You know, they can enable all cars. Google could not do all cars. They could only work for a few individual cars. Hopefully this answers your questions, right? All right. One more question. Okay, the other question from online is, uh, can they be sent back and forth? An example meaning, can you send them to a vehicle to be displayed? Yeah, I think uh, the messages are exchanged back and forth by all vehicles, but the driver interface ultimately, depending upon application, that is what will be displayed. So for example, it's a crit critical safety application, M maybe brakes will take over before driver knows. But if this is a traveler information message, you know, as the contents will be extracted from the message, and then it will be displayed to the driver. For example, you know, uh, work zone had two miles, or congestion had two miles, these, these kind of things. So depending upon the application, there will be a user interface. And uh, right now it is being debated what kind of user driver interface should be there, a visual or audio or these kind of things, because you want to avoid uh, you want to uh, you want to avoid distracting drivers as well. So many human factors are involved, uh, and uh, human factors, people are doing research, and I think Brian is involved with some of them as well. All right. Well, Any? Just one last question yes. from online. Um, could a smartphone be made to broadcast a BSM for the case of pedestrians or drivers in older vehicles? Yeah. I think this is what is anticipated, that once you know uh, this is widespread, uh, deployed widespread, then pedestrians will be equipped with the SRC2, and you know, the best way to include the SRC chip is in the phone, right? Because most of, you know, 75% of the, of the people have, have phones, not necessarily smartphones right now, but, you know, uh, this is what, what will happen ultimately. So with that, uh, is that, is that all? Uh, we're done with the, all the questions? No other question? Actually, I yes. have a question. Well, it's a more of a clarification rather than a question. There's a lot of people that are confusing the SRC with radar and LIDAR, the SRC is a radio, is a method of communication. It doesn't know location. There are other sensors in the vehicle that are producing the location, and the communication is handled by the SRC. So your picture when you saw the radar and the LIDAR and, the, and you said that the SRC has a greater range, that's not a fair picture because the DSRC only sees the vehicles that are reporting their location. LiDAR and radar will see everything that it is in the range around the vehicle, a stone, a piece of wood, you know, everything. Yeah, that, 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 is, so that, yeah, that is true. That misconception mm -hmm. is actually quite common. People think DSRC has the location, but it's only the communication part. Um, so two vehicles that have GPS, they will know where each other are. The pedestrian can have a smartphone with the SRC. That's not it. 
the pedestrian has to have a GPS or some other positioning device in order to transmit its location through the DSRC. Yeah. So, so, so GPS is an essential part of the infrastructure of the DSRC. You know, it has to provide an, and, and he is right that, you know, LADAR is a sensor. Uh, GP, uh, the DSRC is, is a communication technology. So this is important. And the LIDAR can actually provide its, uh, its, its uh, sensing uh, objects to DSRC radio and which can be communicated to the other vehicle. So it can work as an additional sensor only. Uh, any other comment or question? No, I believe that is all we have. And that's all we have time for today. So all right, thank you very much. Please join me in helping thank our speaker. So uh, just a quick comment. Um, for those of you that don't know, there will not be a seminar next week due to the CTS Research Conference. So the next, um, the next seminar will be two weeks from today. So please join us for our ninth seminar in two weeks. Thank you.